Over the past 10 years, we've accomplished so much. We created the Kidney Health Initiative to foster innovation and give patients a much needed voice in clinical trials and new treatments. The patient voice is critical to Key's success. In addition to Key, we've supported the next generation of kidney health experts with Kidney Cure. Over $50 million in support is fueling innovative research and fellowships. $50 million in funding. That's what I call progress. And for over a decade, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a priority at ASN. We've expanded access to workshops and mentors, committing millions to assist those considering a career in nephrology. And we've done this while pushing for kidney health care justice for all. Partnerships with the community are vital in making true progress. It's been a decade of progress. We should be proud of ourselves. But there's more to do. Change is hard. But we can do it. Together. Inch by inch. We'll get there. We can do anything. When we're united. Please welcome the president of the American Society of Nephrology, Dr. Michelle Josephson. Throughout human history and across all civilizations and cultures, there have been tales and legends of brave people, real and mythic, going forth on epic journeys to fight for good and against evil. These journeys are arduous, filled with trials and tribulations. Through these endeavors, our hero is tested, transformed, finds fulfillment, and eventually returns triumphant having improved and usually bettering the situations of others. Think of Ulysses, Joan of Arc, Mahatma Gandhi, Harriet Tubman, Luke Skywalker. These real and mythic individuals are all recognized as heroes. And as we look at the world today and the horrifying events that are occurring, it is, a cle it is clear we need heroes today more than ever. We are fortunate to have plenty of heroes in the medical field. Just last month, Catalin Carrico and her research partner won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their mRNA research, but Carrico's path to that milestone was filled with barriers. When her research program ran out of money, she and her family sold all their possessions and they moved from Hungary to Philadelphia, just a few miles from here, to continue her research career. Once here, she could not get grant support and she was prevented from advancing along the academic promotions path. And to top it all off, she was diagnosed with cancer. But she persevered in her mRNA research, and her grit paid off for herself as well as for humanity when her work was used to develop COVID vaccines. It's wonderful to have a local modern-day hero in medical research, but this is Kidney Week, so I want to tell you about a nephrology hero, a Dutch physician named Dr. Willem Kalf. You may have heard of Kalf, but may not know his spellbinding story. Kalf was a 1938 graduate of University of Leiden Medical School. His life's mission crystallized when during postgraduate training, he witnessed a young man slowly die of kidney failure. At the time, no effective treatments existed, so he decided to create a machine that would do the work of the kidneys. With help from his mentor, Dr. Leonard Pollock Daniels, Kalf started creating an artificial kidney using cellophane for membranes. Others had tried before, but Kalf was not deterred by prior failures or the, the seeming impossibility of his task. Kalf's quest would be difficult under any circumstances, but these were no ordinary times. At about the same time that he began his mission to create an artificial kidney, World War II erupted. When Nazi Germany overtook the Netherlands, Pollock Daniels died by suicide to avoid persecution. 
Unwilling to work under the Nazi sympathizer appointed to fill Pollock Daniel's post, Kauf moved to a town 70 miles away. Take a moment to imagine your country engulfed in a world war and overtaken by hostile forces, your mentor dead, and you exiled to a remote part of the country. Most of us, and I will include myself in that, would have stopped our quest right then, but not Kalf. He persevered, finding others to help him with the project, meeting with colleagues at five in the morning to avoid detection by the local Nazi supervisor. Supplies were scarce, so he had to improvise. The aluminum for the drum of the artificial kidney came from an airplane that was shot down nearby. The conduit through which blood would be pumped was, part, was apart from an old Model T Ford cooling system. The enamel tub that the dialysis sat in was secretly made by enamelware factory that was under orders to only make pots and pans for the German army. In 1943, Kauf piloted his artificial kidney to save patients destined to die because of acute kidney failure. Things did not go well. He treated 16 patients without success. His colleagues had little faith in his program. Working conditions deteriorated as the war progressed. The supply of cellophane from the United States for the diffusion membrane ran out, so he had to substitute German sausage casings. Transporting patients to his hospital was increasingly dangerous. One of the project's engineers was shot to death on suspicions of working with the resistance. But Kalf continued his work of perfecting his artificial kidney, and finally, in 1945, his 17th patient, a 67-year-old woman in uremic coma, regained consciousness after 11 hours of hemodialysis with Kalf's dialyzer. She lived six more years before dying of a different ailment. Kalf's story is remarkable, but he is not our only hero in nephrology. Dr. Building, built, Dr. Belding Scribner, who made long-term dialysis possible through creation of a durable dialysis access, better known as the Scribner shunt, is another one. Ronald Herrick, who donated a kidney to his brother Richard, making history during the first successful living donor kidney transplant, is another one. Edith Helm is another hero. She was the first woman to receive a successful living donor kidney transplant from her sister and the first woman to successfully deliver a baby after kidney transplant, thus paving the way for women with transplants who want to become pregnant. Shep Glazer, who in 1972 dialyzed before the U.S. House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee and helped produce the Medicare program's coverage for dialysis for every American, regardless of age, income, or disability, is another one. Today, I'd like to challenge you to consider whether you can write your own epic tale about your contributions to nephrology. The journey you're taking is that of innovation and discovery, and all of us have contributed in a meaningful way, be it through patient care, research, teaching, or administration. Our final audacious destination is a world without kidney diseases. But before we can get there, we have battles to fight, dragons to slay and seas to cross. We are all part of these journeys, each generation taking its turn in our odyssey of discovery, advances and improvement, learning from the generations before, moving the field forward and furthering our understanding, sometimes curing and ultimately improving the lives of people with kidney disease. This is why we are all here today as part of Team Nephrology continuing this journey. In many epic quests, there is a point when progress slows down. Think of Ulysses trying to return to Ithaca. The hero is distracted by temptation in one form or another. This, too, happened in nephrology. For years in the United States, government spending in nephrology was focused, understandably, on dialysis care with relatively little investment in research. 
Treatment options were limited with few effective therapies, little new to offer, and few innovations on the horizon. But that period is over. We're once again back in the triumphant part of that hero's journey. Just consider the discoveries and advances we have seen recently. The, the introduction of the Flozins and Phenarinone promising added years of dialysis-free life, the potential for anaxaplin in the treatment of APOL1-associated kidney disease, the potential for anti-CD19 CAR T-cell therapy for refractory lupus, and understanding of how AKI leads to injury progression and tubule remodeling, insights into fluid management to prevent AKI, applying multi-omics to understand tissue architecture and response to injury, the potential for silencing RNA treatment, xyl B in hypertension, Baxterstrat for treatment-resistant hypertension, genetic testing to identify kidney diseases, discovery of autoantibodies targeting nephrons, nephron, and xenotransplantation as an option within reach to name just a few. So, as you see, we have been making real progress on many fronts in our epic struggle against kidney diseases. And today, I will describe three of the many areas that we have advanced together this year. Transplant, workforce and training, and sustainability. And we will begin with transplant. As a transplant nephrologist, I must address the elephant in the room. Over the years, you have likely heard or perhaps even felt that ASN is not a home for transplant nephrologists. Years ago, that may have been true. As a big tent organization, ASN did not prioritize transplant nephrology. Consequently, transplant nephrologists felt marginalized and banded together to form the American Society of Transplantation. That is old history. ASN has evolved and matured. For years, ASN has embraced transplant nephrology, serving as a leading trusted voice in, in advising the U.S. government on transplant policy. If you're not persuaded that ASN supports transplant nephrology and transplant nephrologists, simply consider ASN's United for Kidney Health campaign in which the second of four pillars is, quote, transform transplant and increase access to donor kidneys. And if I've still not convinced you, what more evidence can there be besides having me, a transplant nephrologist, serve as president? And we've had other transplant nephrologists serving in ASN leadership as well. Dr. Barbara Murphy, who died in 2021, before she would have served as ASN president last year, mentored many of us as a colleague, supervisor, and supernova. She was a hero in our midst. A few months ago, A few months ago, celebrated American author Amy Silverstein published a piece weeks before her death titled, My Transplanted Heart and I Will Die Soon. In this gut-wrenching op-ed, she observed, quote, while transplantation has saved thousands of lives, transplant professionals and their patients largely rely on 40-year-old therapies. She was right. She is right. We must expand investment in transplant-related research and in innovation, a top ASN policy. Through legislative and regulatory advocacy, we are transforming transplant on a multitude of fronts. Our approach has been guided by always asking, what is best for patients? The answer to that question is our North Star. The answer to that question is most often kidney transplantation. What you see on the screen is a photo of one of my patients. So excited about receiving a kidney transplant, she commemorated it by having a tattoo of a kidney placed over the area of her transplant. And she was excited for me to share this photo with all of you this morning. The U.S. transplant system has served many patients well over the years. 
I am proud to call myself a transplant nephrologist. And in this capacity, I work with dedicated, innovative, skilled, compassionate, and impactful nephrologists, surgeons, pathologists, nurses, social workers, APPs, dietitians, and many others. I continue to be in awe of the advancements we have made. We now routinely transplant people we wouldn't have dreamed could be candidates when I started my career. For example, older individuals, those with HIV, people with vascular disease, and those who are highly sensitized. Nevertheless, we can and we must do better. We must provide transplants to more individuals who would benefit from and attain long-lasting graft survival. ASN has worked with the Obama, Trump, and Biden administrations to effect positive change in transplant. We are advocating to expedite the clear government reforms necessary to maximize patient access to transplant, enable the use of more organs, establish transparency to improve access to transplant, ensure the ac that access is equitable, and reduce barriers in the kidney health ecosystem. To achieve these goals, we have been in dialogue with key government officials, including the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and members of Congress. These are exciting times. The Biden administration's Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network Modernization Initiative implements crucial reforms to help more patients receive a transplant. And the bipartisan legislation in the U.S. House and Senate that supports it, the Securing the U.S. Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network Act became law earlier this year. The administration is on the record that, quote, improving the organ transplantation system is a priority. I am grateful to the many leaders across, gov across, governmental, across the government who share our vision for advancing the transplant system and increasing access and transparency for all our patients who would benefit from a transplant, regardless of race, as gender, ethnicity, or geographic location. We are at a pivotal juncture in the nearly 40 years history of governmental regulation of transplantation. This huge accomplishment is the most significant opportunity to improve the transplant network since its establishment. That does not mean this opportunity will be easy. It won't be. Change is hard. And in this critical moment, we have a choice, you and I. We can opt to look backwards to the past and nostalgically focus on how things used to be, or we can move forward deliberately and intentionally crafting a better transplant system for our patients and all the nephrology health pro professionals who care for them. I urge you to join, to join me in moving forward. The Securing the U.S. OPTN Act and the HRSA Modernization Initiative are not the end of ASN's transplant journey. Just one big milestone as we look to move forward together. We are also making progress on our second front, workforce and training, although real challenges remain. These challenges are not unique to nephrology. They affect every facet of healthcare today, and they were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past 14 years, interest in nephrology careers has declined. Neph nephrology applications fell 30 percent, while nephrology fellowship slots increased 34 percent. Although positions fill after the match, not all positions are taken. Given this picture, we must reevaluate how we can best make the case for why nephrology. We, knew we need to expose students, residents, and other trainees at every medical school and graduate school to the excitement, the joy, and the fascination of our field. Many of us, myself included, entered this field because of our mentors, and I believe each of us in this audience could identify mentors who made a difference and were personal heroes. I know I can. I can also think of people who I observe mentoring others. For example, Sharon Silbiger, 
A past president of women in nephrology was not only a pioneer in research on the effect of sex and progression of CKD, but also an impactful mentor. So, so much so that she was the reason many residents at Albert Einstein entered nephrology. Sharon understood that no one can do this for us. No one cares about nephrology in our patients like you do or I do, or like the 850 million people worldwide with kidney diseases do. It's up to all of us to make clear why we love our field and why the next generation should invest their future with us in nephrology. Indeed, a record 92% of nephrology fellows responding to ASN's 2023 Nephrology Fellow Survey would recommend that medical students and residents pursue the specialty. There is no quick fix. A decade ago, ASN launched a multi-pronged approach to ignite and sustain interest in our specialty, including Kidney treks in my hometown of Chicago, where I taught a transplant module and interacted with the brightest of medicine's next generation. Look around here today and you may see one of 300 participants in ASN's Kidney Stars program, which seeks to kindle a passion for nephrology in medical students, residents, and researchers. I challenge you to show each of them the answer to the question, why nephrology? One half of U.S. nephrologists and nearly two-thirds of our future workforce completed medical school outside this country, which is why ASN, in concert with our colleagues at American Nephrologists of Indian Origin, is engaged in efforts to help international medical graduates seeking to train and work in the United States. ASN is also working to reintroduce the Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act, important legislation that seeks to recapture unused visas and provide them to the physicians and nurses at the system level. This year, we have been reinvigorating training, working with the entities responsible for regulating training and certification, and implementing proposals set out by the ASN Task Force on the Future of Nephrology. In 2024, for example, you will see more of an emphasis of training in home modalities like peritoneal dialysis. ASN also partnered with Home Dialysis University this year to help at least 30 fellows annually participate in this excellent program. As a transplant nephrologist, I understand all too well how our workforce is insufficient to meet the overwhelming demand. Institutions' difficulties in supporting transplant fellowships have been a roadblock, which is why ASN and AST have formed a joint task force to achieve ACGME accreditation for transplant nephrology fellowships, making them eligible for federal educational funding. This approach won't solve all problems, but is a meaningful first step. Dr. Josh Levitsky, a transplant hepatologist and current AST president, supports this effort, noting that his field benefited tremendously from such accreditation. Our nursing colleagues also face substantial workforce challenges, which is why ASN will be meeting with the leadership of the American Nephrology Nurses Association to discuss how best to overcome this shortage. Working together in a meaningful way for the first time ASN and ANNA can help support the kidney care team. The third area we are addressing is sustainability. The relationship between nephrology and the environment is bidirectional and very complex. Our medical treatments affect the environment, and the environment impacts kidney diseases, as well as our ability to provide care to those in need. We must reduce the environmental footprint of tools to manage kidney failure and foster resilience among people living with or at risk of kidney diseases who are uniquely impacted by climate change. As my daughter Maya tells me, own your impact. Yes, in nephrology, we must own our impact on the environment. Consider this. 
the huge amount of water dialysis requires. Globally, dialysis uses 265 billion, yes, billion liters of medically pure water every year. And that doesn't even account for the tremendous number of disposable plastics we consume and discard each year. ASN is collaborating to specifically address that huge impact. In 2023, ASN joined the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. We also joined the International Society of Nephrology's Green K Initiative, which seeks to advance education, innovation, and clinical pathways to address the impact of climate change on kidney health. With alterations in weather patterns related to climate change, we are seeing more intensified natural disasters, such as hurricanes and, and wildfires. These catastrophic events can pose insurmountable barriers for patients to receive life-saving dialysis treatments. Through its Emergency Partnership Initiative, ASN works closely with the Kidney Community Emergency Response Coalition, Direct Relief, the European Renal Association, and ISN to ensure that kidney patients have access to the care they need and kidney health professionals can provide that care. Our Earth's warming temperatures have been associated with AKI and ensuing CKD, and rising temperatures have been implicated in an increased incidence of nephrolithiasis. These relationships these have been most studied in developing countries and among people with high outdoor exposure, often marginalized workers. Climate health is a worldwide nephrology equity and social justice issue. Recently, Time magazine highlighted the emerging connection between continued extreme heat exposure, dehydration, and chronic kidney disease of non-traditional origin. The article quoted epidemiologist Jason Glazer, the CEO of La Isla Network, an organization that is dedicated to protecting workers in our changing climate. Glazer called CKD of non-traditional origin, quote, the black lung disease of today's outdoor laborers, and climate change is making it worse. Ed Cashy, who received the ASN President's Medal in a few minutes, and Glazer, are also heroes whose journeys have improved the world for people with kidney diseases. The human toll of rising temperatures and kidney failure in developing countries has been depicted by Cashy, a photographer, cinematographer, and social activist. This morning, you will see some of his work and hear from him. And if you are interested in learning more, and as inhabitants of the earth, we should all be interested, you can meet with Kashi after this morning's plenary session in the ASN booth on the exhibit floor. He will share with you how photojournalism is an effective tool for social justice. These beautiful and haunting images have increased awareness worldwide and have led to policy changes that are helping people in vulnerable populations. So, as you've heard, we are making progress in these these three vital areas, transplant, workforce and training, and sustainability. But our journey is not done yet and very much still in progress. As we continue our quest for a world without kidney diseases, I challenge each of you to make public what has become the best kept secret that nephrology is an exciting, fulfilling, fascinating profession that needs and values your contributions. For the people with kidney diseases in this audience, including the SEALs champions, let your elected officials know how important it is that they support kidney care research and education. You have the most effective and powerful voice of anyone in this room. So let's take a moment to acknowledge our patients and the contributions they, you, are making in the fight against kidney diseases. To everyone in this room, I say stay on your journey. Give it your all. Keep battling to move us forward. As a clinician, your journey looks different than the researchers 
or the educators or the administrators, but we are all in this quest together. We all have different strengths, different tools, and different school skills. To make a difference, use what you are good at and enjoy. Persevere if you believe in what you are doing, even if others don't. Don't give in to the naysayers. Keep moving forward, building on what you and those who have come before you have accomplished. Never stop fighting. This room is filled with people who will build upon what you, the extended family of nephrologists, and I have done and are going to do. Our journey is audacious. Our journey is long, and our journey is often not linear. No matter the occasional detours, we are moving forward, moving towards a world without kidney diseases. Among people with kidney diseases, the professionals who treat them, and the scientists finding new paths forward, the kidney community is full of heroes. The heroes I have described this morning are remarkable, but not unique. And here's what I know. Heroes come in a thousand shapes and sizes. There are heroes in all cultures and heroes from all eras. Having the privilege of serving as ASM president, I have a unique opportunity to hear from, work with, and meet nephrologists all over the globe. I know who nephrologists are. I know who you are. You are mounting a daily fight on behalf of your patients in the field. You are working on matters of existential importance and an indiv- on an individual and a global scale. You are 21,000 heroes from 140 countries, including the estimated 12,000 in Philadelphia this week. It has been my honor to work with and serve as your president this year. Enjoy the meeting, have a great time in the city of brotherly and sisterly love, and continue your journey. Thank you. There are so many people to thank for this year. Working with ASN has been an incredible experience. My colleagues on the ASN Council, we've collaborated over so many things and formed strong friendships. I have valued your thoughtful input, perspectives, and leadership. It has been a true pleasure to work closely with you, have spirited discussions, learn from each of you, and spend time together. ASN staff, dedicated, thoughtful, professional, and creative individuals, we are lucky to have them here. It has been a true joy to work with this group of wonderful people, especially their fearless leader, Todd Ibrahim. A big shout out to the Kidney Week Education Committee. They have the tough job of trying to balance competing interests, including a broad range of topics, while presenting the highest quality and most exciting advances. Led by Diane McKay and Mark Parazella, the committee did an amazing job putting together a phenomenal program. Thank you to my colleagues at the University of Chicago for their tremendous understanding and support this year. And last but not least, with thanks, <clears throat> with thanks and love to my family. To <clears throat> Today, I am joined by my husband, Steve, daughter, Maya, brother Neil and his wife Cha, sister Deborah, and sister-in-law Karen. 
thank you for being here. <clears throat> My parents, Alan and Adele, are no longer with us, but they are here in spirit celebrating Kidney Week. They would have loved it. Each year, ASN recognizes companies that support society programs and activities through ASN's corporate support program. Their generosity and commitment help ASN provide the highest standard of educational and scientific programs to thousands of kidney professionals. This year, 27 companies participated in this program. I'd like to personally thank AstraZeneca, GSK, Otsuka, and Vistera, and Trevere Therapeutics for their commitment to improving kidney health worldwide. The ASN's President Medal, President's Medal highlights individuals who have helped ASN advance its mission and made significant contributions to the kidney community. I'm very honored to present this year's medal to Ed Cashy, a renowned photojournalist, filmmaker, speaker, and educator dedicated to documenting the social and geopolitical issues that define our times. As an important element of this commitment, he has focused his camera on individuals living with chronic kidney disease of undetermined etiology, humanizing the problem and increasing awareness of the worldwide epidemic. Through compelling Through compelling photojournalism and a partnership with La, the La Isla Network, Mr. Cashy is bringing attention to CKDU in short films and still photographs. His 2015 documentary, Under Cane, depicts the devastation of kidney disease in sugarcane workers in uh, Nicaragua. Hidden under, the, in, hidden under the Indian Sun, a 2017 documentary follows individuals with kidney disease who worked in the rice fields in southeastern India. His 2018 documentary, With Every Breath, shares the tragic story of a family and others with kidney disease in Peru. A 2022 documentary, Too Hot to Work, follows a group of laborers who traveled from Nepal to Qatar, some of whom became dialysis dependent after working for hours in the heat. In addition to his focus on CKDU, Mr. Kashi has covered the plight of the Kurdish people and the impact of the oil industry upon the impoverished Niger Delta, the Protestant community in Northern Ireland, and the strife between the Shiites and the Sunnis in Iraq. He and his wife, Julie Winokur, are co-founders of a nonprofit multimedia company called Talking Eyes Media, which was created in 2002 to deliver issues debt oriented stories to the general public. Mr. Cashy worked for the National Geographic Society in more than 60 countries and has contributed to the New York Times Magazine, Times, Media Storm, Ford Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, GEO, Newsweek, and MSNBC. His innovative approach to photography and filmmaking has earned him recognition by the POYI Awards as 2015's Multimedia Photographer of the Year, World Press Photo, Com Arts, and American Photography. As my husband is a photography gallerist, on a personal note, I am particularly happy that the medal this year is recognizing the work of a photojournalist. Over the years, through viewing the photographic images with my husband, I appreciate the powerful impact the photography has on the viewers. They did not have any complaint which suggests a kidney problem. But when we do a creatinine testing, their creatinine were high. And we did the ultrasound examination, the kidneys were shrunken. My nanan took mundu, bore less ever. A kidney lana amesi manan ki, kidney betty the manukunanasla. 
పిల్లలు సెట్ అవ్వదు అని చెప్పారు నాకు అసలు నా కిడ్నీలు అన్న అమ్మేసి మా నాన్నకి కిడ్నీ పెట్టిద్దాం అనుకున్నాను అసలు సో ఇఫ్ ఇట్ ఆల్ గ్లోబల్ అలయన్స్ ఇస్ దేర్ లైక్ దిస్ వేర్ వి కెన్ ఇన్ఫ్లుయెన్స్ ది గవర్నమెంట్స్ టు టేక్ నెసెసరీ స్టెప్స్ వి కెన్ నాట్ సాల్వ్ దిస్ ప్రాబ్లం అలోన్ ఇంకా <laughs> Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ed Cashy. Well, thank you very much, Michelle and ASN, for um, having me here for this award. Um, this is a little daunting. Usually the crowds that I talk to are about a tenth this size. Um, but, um, you know, it's always an honor to receive recognition for the work that we create. But um, there's something very special about receiving recognition from organizations that are outside of the art, media, photo world. Um, for me, when that happens, it's a... sort of a uh, affirmation that the work we've done the stories we've told you know the issue that I've I've chosen to focus on has a deeper meaning and so for me this honor is really profound in that way and thank you so much and god knows we need a lot of uh, people working on the kidney because clearly there is a problem a global problem with with the kidneys um and i would be remiss not to uh, also thank jason glazer who you mentioned uh he couldn't be here today unfortunately but um he's really the person who drew me in you know my journey uh with kidney disease is 10 years old now it's for the last decade i've been following this issue i've worked in seven countries now around the world and uh jason is really the one who sort of drew me in in january of 2013 i went to nicaragua on this assignment a small assignment to do something on some disease i'd never heard of and um but once i got to chichigalpa in nicaragua which is the heart of the sugarcane growing region every single day there was a funeral for a sugarcane worker every single day i'm not exaggerating and um they all had died from this disease ckdu i know now it's ckdnt we have to come up with a term we all agree upon um there's enough confusion in the world um and anyway and then it was at that moment where i realized this i was going to make this my next personal project and uh you know i tend to work on long form in depth um issues and projects and so for the last decade i've been pursuing this in large part you know jason has been uh, a tremendous collaborator uh and he's also a visionary you know he's a filmmaker come activist and now he's an epidemiologist and uh he's absolutely brilliant and uh and it points to another aspect of um being able to do this work which i call advocacy journalism um and it's different than regular journalism i'm not just 
going to shine a spotlight on a problem, I also want to reveal some solution or some, some aspect of hope around that issue because I feel too much journalism leaves us feeling um, powerless. Like we have no agency. And uh, having two young kids, uh, two kids who are now grown and watching over, especially their teenage years when I would come back from Iraq or Afghanistan or these places and I could just see like their eyes glazed over because it was too much for them to deal with sort of all the issues and the problems of the world. That's where I kind of realized that I needed to sort of shift my work from not just reporting on the problems, but also trying to show solutions. And I know that's what you guys have dedicated your lives to, is finding solutions. Um, so, but, and the issue of collaboration, that is critical to doing this kind of work. You know, having folks like you who have led us to figure out, you know, where are the places we need to go uh, where CKD is, is, is underreported or um, underdiagnosed. You know, that this, this collaboration is actually absolutely critical for media makers like myself to create materials that you all will find effective to improve and forward your work. So thank you so much for this and uh, have an amazing week. <laughs> Established last year, the Barbara Murphy Award honors leaders who strengthen the foundation of nephrology while advancing the field through innovation, creativity, inspiration, and tenacity, and have the courage to forge new paths, overcome challenges, and serve as exemplars for, generation, for future generations of nephrologists to admire, emulate, and amplify. Barbara Murphy was astonishing in so many ways. She transformed kidney care, not only through her tireless advocacy, but also her innovative research. She's transformed the field because she's inspired people. The Dr. Barbara Murphy Lifetime Achievement Award celebrates uh, individuals who are pioneers in the field of nephrology, who have uh, really done breakthrough things. Some of Barbara's earliest work identified RNA signatures that can predict whether or not a transplant is going to do well or not and whether or not physicians should intervene early. Barbara is a true trailblazer in every aspect of the word. You know, I think one amazing example is her advocacy back in um, the mid-90s to make sure that HIV patients had equal access to getting a kidney transplant. Her public policy work in getting the um, immunosuppression bill passed will affect countless individuals for years to come. Barbara was one of the incredible bright lights of women in leadership positions as chair of the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai and then a counselor of the American Society of Nephrology and would have been its president. She was also a great administrator. She knew how to work with people and how to move a program forward. The first thing that you really notice about her is her smile and her warmth. She breathed life into a room. She was, above all, a wonderful human being, a friend, a mother, a colleague, a mentor, a role model, somebody who inspires each of us um, every single day. The American Society of Nephrology presents the 2023 Barbara T. Murphy Award to Dr. Rulon Parekh for her exemplary leadership and pioneering research in nephrology. A noted clinician scientist and international leader, Dr. Parekh is Vice President of Academics at Women's College Hospital in Toronto. She previously served as Associate Chief of Clinical Research at the Hospital for Sick Children, now known as Sick Kids, and Division Director of Nephrology in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. She also served as Program Director for Pediatric and Adult Nephrology at University of Toronto and NIH T32 Director for the Renal Disease Epidemiology Training Grant. 
After earning her MD at Albany Medical College, Dr. Parekh was trained in pediatrics and internal medicine at the University of Michigan, where she went on to complete a combined medicine and pediatric nephrology fellowship and later earned an MS at the School of Public Health. She then completed her postdoctoral training at Johns Hopkins University and joined its faculty in 2000. Dr. Parekh moved to Canada in 2008 as a faculty member at the University of Toronto and a scientist at SickKids Research Institute. Since then, she has held numerous key positions in nephrology, pediatrics, and medicine, and was often the first woman to do so. She has developed highly innovative programs in training and education, seamless integration of clinical care, and research training in adult and pediatric nephrology. Her many international projects and collaborations have inspired countless trainees and colleagues worldwide. Dr. Parekh's research has focused on the clinical, genetic, and environmental risk factors leading to chronic kidney disease. Among many other discoveries, Dr. Parekh and her colleague Linda Cow identified the genetic locus that accounts for 70% of the prevalence of end-stage kidney disease in African Americans. This led to hundreds of publications in the nephrology community and numerous collaborative studies to further examine genetic factors that impact CKD, particularly in Africa. Dr. Parekh also first identified cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of mortality in children and sudden cardiac death as a leading cause of mortality for those on dialysis. These and other findings have influenced the screening and care of patients and made a global impact on nephrology. Dr. Parekh has trained and mentored more than 100 nephrology trainees and faculty, medical and undergraduate students, many of whom are now successful clinician scientists and leaders in the field. Her outstanding accomplishments have been recognized with numerous awards and honors. An elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, she is a past recipient of ASN's Carl W. Gottschalk Research Grant and an associate editor for C. Jason. Much like this award's namesake Dr. Barbara Murphy did, Dr. Rulon Parekh is blazing a trail for the next generation of nephrologists, educators, and scientists. Please welcome this year's Murphy Award recipient, Dr. Rulon Parekh. Thank you very much to the American Society of Nephrology, especially Sue Quigan, who started the award, the awards committee, and most importantly, thank you to my friends and colleagues who nominated me for the award. My career, as you've seen, has been rather unconventional, and as I reflect on it, I recognize that I'm always moving forward, but never straight. And there are three main arcs to my story. Excuse me. First, I believe strongly that research can improve the lives of patients. To be a clinician scientist is the greatest gift. It is complex and curious, weary when waiting for funding, but overall fun and interesting. You'll hear more about the fun and interesting from Dr. Bonnie Basler next. My close colleague, Linda Cow and I are, were early career scientists when we recruited almost 2,000 African Americans to participate in a genetic study to uncover genes associated with end-stage renal disease. In 2008, we published the discovery of the chromosomal locus, which contained the gene APOL1 for end stage, and our colleague Sherry Winkler and Jeffrey Kopp co-published for FSGS. There are now more than 900 publications from many investigators around the world studying APOL1. What an amazing impact. There's even a, a new clinical trial ongoing and the most recent information published in New England Journal. It's exciting as there's hope for patients around the corner. During our study, there were people who thought that we should not continue the project. We often heard that the study was futile. Don't bother working on the genetic admixture map. Move on to something more productive. But we persisted, 
And we persisted because we'd heard many stories where multiple generations of families in the Baltimore area were affected with kidney disease. The participants were really actively seeking answers, even though the study would not directly help them. And sadly, many are not alive today to know that there are clinical trials that are underway to actually prevent kidney disease progression among those that carry APOA1 risk. Conducting research that is patient-centered, patients first, transforms clinical care is incredibly rewarding and worth the time of frustrations, which are few, as our patients need us to innovate and transform care. The second arc of my career is training the next generation of clinicians, nephrologists and scientists. When I started nephrology training at the University of Michigan, there were only two women in nephrology. When I moved to Hopkins, my mentor, Mike Clagg, asked me to co-direct and then lead the T32 training grant in kidney disease epidemiology. This was my first opportunity to make change. The civil rights activist, Marion Edelman, said, you cannot be what you cannot see. My goal was to increase diversity in the nephrology uh, division, encourage more to do science and academic medicine, and it's important that we engage, retain, and advance diverse persons in research, academic medicine, and leadership. It's vital for our innovation, and as you heard from Dr. Josephson, our sustainability. We need to reflect the communities that we serve and the patients that we see. I've had the pleasure of training hundreds of high school, undergraduate, and graduate students, nephrology trainees, and faculty. Many of my trainees are here. They've gone on to successful academic careers. Some are division chiefs, journal editors, and uniquely, next year's president of the American Society of Nephrology, and also Amer president of the American Society of Pediatric Nephrology. Dr. Cruz and Dr. Atkinson will jointly uh, be present next year, and they were both trainees in my lab. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see how everyone evolves, and I really hope that working with me has played a small part in their career. The last arc in my career is my family. Without family, you can't succeed. There's your work family, your social family, and your immediate family. And I must thank all of them for their support and inspiration. And I can't mention everyone's name, but each person has greatly influenced my career. For my work families at the University of Michigan, I had my form of formative clinical training, and I really think of Michigan as home. At Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and Public Health, I learned to think bigger and probe deeply, and Hopkins gave me my research wings. At the University of Toronto, my research focus has changed from a population approach to precision medicine, given the vast clinical experience that we have in our divisions. Toronto has guided my leadership development, and I've held several leadership positions there. But really supporting early career faculty, I see as mission critical, especially in nephrology. My lab team have also been with me for a decade and are absolutely my family. And I want to thank my social family who have my back. Handling obstacles is much, much easier to navigate with friends. Family first was instilled to me by my parents. And both my parents are amazing supporters. When I started, my mom would fly down to Baltimore to make sure that my kids were taken care of so I could keep working and advancing my career. My children are my joy. They are grateful that I have a job and so that I can't become and don't have the opportunity to become a helicopter parent. My children have learned some nephrology along the way. Occasionally, they give some basic dialysis orders, and they know what creatinine means. The next part's quite hard for me. The Barbara T. Murphy Award Um, <laughs> it's very special to me and my family. Barbara was my sister-in-law. She and I were friends beyond being family. We often came to ASN, and I shouldn't say this out loud, but we would sneak out for lunch and uh, early cocktails. Um, my husband, Kieran Murphy, um, Barbara's brother, was extremely supportive of both of us and our careers. He believes that women can do anything and has often been our most ardent supporter. And like Barbara, he has a wicked sense of humor, and often we were the fall guy for him. Peter, Barbara's husband, similarly is extremely supportive of Barbara and myself. He was a rock to lean on, and he carried on that tradition supporting my children. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's been two years 
um, since Barbara's passing. Life goes on, but there's always an endearing home. In Barbara's last few months, she and I often talk about research, the next generation, patients first, and evolving leadership. And we hope that we'll see that, in fact, having a meaningful and impactful is an impactful, uh, important part for an impactful life. We both agree that it's not the length of life, but the depth of life that is important. She and I both chose nephrology, a little unexpectedly that we chose the same specialty, but we believed it was the best specialty with some of the brightest minds. And we hope that by hearing some of our story, you're inspired to keep moving forward, though never straight. Thank you. Okay, good morning and welcome to Kidney Week. My name is Mark Perizella, and it's been my pleasure to serve as Kidney Week Committee Co-Chair alongside my good friend and colleague, Dr. Diane McKay. Thank you for joining us here in Philadelphia. Today's state-of-the-art lecture will be delivered by Dr. Bonnie Basler on tiny conspiracies, cell-to-cell -cell communication in bacteria, and new approaches to antimicrobials. She is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and the Squibb Professor and Chair of the Department of Molecular Biology at Princeton University. She is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Basler's laboratory focuses on the molecular mechanisms that bacteria use for intercellular communication. Her research on quorum sensing is paving the way for the development of novel therapies for combating bacteria by disrupting the quorum sensing mediated communication. At Princeton, Dr. Basler directed the Molecular Biology Graduate Program from 2002 to 2008 and chaired Princeton University's Council on Science and Technology for six years. And during that time, she rejuvenated the science curriculum for humanists. She's a passionate advocate for diversity in the sciences and is actively involved in and committed to educating lay people, lay people in science. Dr. Basler has received numerous awards, and I'm only going to list a few of them, and honors over the years. Some of her highlights include the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the American Society of Microbiology's Eli Lilly Investigator Award, the Wiley Prize in Biomedical Science, the National Academy's Richard Lounsbury Award, the Shaw Prize in Life Sciences and Medicine, the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, the Dixon Prize in Medicine, and the Ernst Schering Prize. In 2012, Dr. Bowser was elected to the Royal Society and to the American Philosophical Society. More recently, she received the Gruber Prize in Genetics for her groundbreaking discoveries and the Wolf Prize in Chemistry. Dr. Basler has performed a remarkable amount of national and international service, including President of the American Society for Microbiology in 2010 to 2011, Chair of the American Academy of Microbiology Board of Governors from 2011 to 2014, and member of the National Science Board for six years, being nominated by President Barack Obama. Welcome, Dr. Basler. Oh my goodness, um, it's such a delight for me to be invited here. I thank you for the chance to get to share my science with a brand new group of people to me. And I want to say it is an honor and it is humbling to come after the first three speakers. I am happy to be here as part of your mission and it's awe-inspiring. Okay, so with that, let me tell you a little bit about what we do down the road. 
So what I do at Princeton with my gang is we always try to understand how bacteria get any bang for their buck. So um, bacteria have been known for about 500 years, and for 150 of those years, they've been known to cause disease. So on the top of this first slide, what you're seeing are pictures under a microscope of some notorious bacteria that have no business being in or on a human, but when they get in or on us, they can cause disease, make us sick, or kill us. Increasingly, what my field is learning in the last decades or a couple decades or so is that there's also this magical consortium of bacteria that live with every higher organism called the microbiome. And they give higher organisms all of these traits that our human genomes don't have. So they digest our, some of our food, they, they teach our immune system how to defend itself, they provide us micronutrients. This list goes on and on. So what we know about bacteria is that they can either take our lives away from us, they can kill us, or they are life-giving themselves. So those are facts about bacteria. And my gang understands that, but what we're trying to understand not is that they can do that, but how is it that bacteria can have this power? They're these puny, itty-bitty little critters. So how can they kill us or keep us alive? And so what I want to try to show you, and you just heard a good introduction to it, is that the way bacteria get their power in nature is by talking to each other with a chemical language counting and recognizing when they have the right number of neighbors around, if they all do something together, they can accomplish feats that they could never accomplish as individuals because individually each bacterium is too small to make a difference. And so that process of chemical communication and orchestrating group behaviors is now called quorum sensing. And what's funny about my field and quorum sensing is that it came from an obscure marine bacterium named Vibrio fischeri that lives in the ocean and has the special property of making bioluminescence. So on this slide, you're looking at the, the organism that started the field. This is a picture of Vibrio fischeri in a flask. These are some Petri plates. And all we did to turn the, to take this picture is turn the lights off in the room and this is what we see. The bacteria glow and we can see it with our eyes. And so we discovered this 30 or 40 years ago and the question that I always wonder is, is given that we've known about bacteria for 500 years, how can it be that nobody discovered they could work in groups until about 40 years ago? And I think the answer is, is that bacteria are invisible. Right? So whether they're doing something alone or something together, how would you know it? You can't see them and you can't see their traits. And what was so powerful about this obscure but beautiful creature, Vibrio fischeri, is that we could just see it. This bioluminescence made the invisible world of the bacteria visible to us, the scientists. And what we noticed, and others in the field, is the way this bacterium made light. What happens is that it would grow and grow and grow and make no light. But all of a sudden, at a particular cell density, all of the bacteria would turn on light and they would do it together. And we could just see it. No light, light. And of course we could measure it and we could follow it as an output of the bacteria sensing when they had the right number of neighbors around that they would all do something together, in this case, make this visible output, bioluminescence. And so that was the way in. We had this bacterium, it made light, we could make mutants, we could follow light, we could look for bacteria that didn't make light when they should, or did make light when they shouldn't. And by doing that, we discovered how this bacterium understood its cell number. And that was through this chemical communication process called quorum sensing. And so this is how it works. This oval is supposed to be my uh, cartoon of a bacterial cell, a Vibrio fischeri cell, this bioluminescent marine bacterium. At low cell density, when the bacterium is alone, it doesn't make light. But what it does do is that it makes and releases small molecules depicted by these red triangles that we call autoinducers. And you can think of them like hormones. So the world is big, bacteria are small. At low cell density, these autoinducers just diffuse away. The bacteria can't detect them, and that says don't make light. 
But as the bacteria grow, as they divide and increase in number, since all of the bacteria are making a share of the autoinducer molecule, the extracellular concentration of the molecule increases in proportion to cell number. And when that molecule hits a particular concentration, the bacteria detect it, and they infer from that detection event that they must have neighbors. And so in unison, all of the bacteria change their gene expression, which changes their behavior. They turn on luciferase, the enzyme that makes light, and in unison, all of the bacteria begin to glow. So they don't have a clue how many cells are around. They're measuring the concentration of this chemical and using it as a proxy for cell number. And we know we're right about this because what we can do is we can spin the cells out in a centrifuge, take the liquids the cells have been grown in, and if we put the liquids on dilute cells, they will turn on light. So the bacteria are measuring the chemical. That's how they count. And so fast forward from this obscure organism that isn't a pathogen, it isn't industrial, ecologically relevant, it simply had this property that we could see long ago. What the field has found over the last few decades is thousands and thousands of cases of bacteria that have chemical communication capacity. So now we have a name for our field, we call it quorum sensing. The bacteria vote with these chemical votes, they take a census, and all of the bacteria change their behavior together. So now we understand that quorum sensing is the norm in the bacterial world, and it controls, in each bacterium that's been studied, it controls hundreds and hundreds of traits. So it's a big deal for the bacterium to decide to change from going in alone to acting as part of a community, and the way they do it are with these chemical communications communication circuits called quorum sensing. And the kinds of behaviors that bacteria control with quorum sensing are ones that take lots of bacteria working together to make the behavior successful. So typically, when bacteria make exoproducts or they give away things to the world, they never get their own product back. It's only when the group makes these public goods together that all of the bacteria succeed by benefiting from one another's work. Okay, so that's quorum sensing, and the reason I'm here is because it's hugely involved in pathogenicity, in biofilm formation and pathogenicity. I'll get to that in a minute. But what we've shown in all kinds of clinically relevant bacteria, that if you make mutants, bacteria that can't talk or can't hear, they're completely non-pathogenic. So bacteria have to act as groups to be virulent. Okay, so now what my lab's shown in the last few years is that it takes more than one molecule for bacteria to have a proper quorum sensing conversation. And so what we showed is that there's many molecules involved, and these molecules encode information about the number of organisms around, but also about who my neighbor is. And so I'll show you that in cartoon on this slide, and then I'll show you the real thing on the next one. So what we've shown is that in each species that's been studied, there's one molecule, in this case this red triangle, that one and only one species makes. So this molecule is for intra-species communication. This is how bacteria count their kin, their siblings. Then there's a molecule that we've shown that each genera makes. So it's the molecule of the family. So in my cartoon, the blue molecule says the genera. So the blue molecule says you're my cousin. The red molecule says you're my twin. Right? So these molecules are saying how closely or distantly these bacteria are related to each other. Then there's a molecule that, as far as we can tell, all bacteria make. They all make the identical molecule, so there's no species information in this molecule. This molecule says other. More recently, we've learned that quorum sensing transcends domain boundaries, so there's a molecule that eukaryotes make that bacteria interpret as an autoinducer, and then we also know that viruses now make quorum sensing molecules, viruses that infect bacteria, that they try to drive bacterial behaviors by either eavesdropping on bacterial molecules or making molecules to which the bacteria respond.
So it's a big blend of molecules, but what we've shown the computation bacteria do is the following. The first thing we think they do is they are asking, am I alone or am I in a group? So the bacteria start measuring these quorum sensing molecules and they start turning on and off appropriate genes based on whether they're alone or they're in a group. But then the much more sophisticated computation that the bacteria do is they measure the ratios of all of these molecules. And so what they can tell then is it me and my kin that's in the majority or is it the enemy? And then they change the quorum sensing genes that they turn on and off at the bottom of these cascades based on who's winning and who's losing in any given environment. So they turn on genes that are all kinds of goodies and useful to share when they're around their kin, and they turn on defensive genes and try to kill their competitors when they're around or surrounded by the enemies. And so what happens, what I'm trying to tell you then is that quorum sensing allows bacteria to count, but it also allows them to tell self from other, friend from foe, and the bacteria access that information and they behave accordingly. And so this, I'm hoping, sounds like a very eukaryotic trait to you guys. This is what happens in our own bodies. But m people in my field, like me, would say that bacteria evolved this capacity billions of years ago to tell self from other. Okay, and so now upping it a little bit, here's the real molecules. So in my slides, the red triangles were these molecules that say self. And so I've just put a smattering of the quorum sensing molecules that are the molecules that are for intra-species communication. And what you can see is that all of the molecules are related. They're homosterine lactones. And the left-hand part of the molecule is identical in every single species that makes it. But these right-hand side chains, you know, these carbon tails, are a little bit different in every single species of bacteria. And what that does is to confer exquisite species specificities to these languages. So bacteria that make, for example, the top molecule are impervious to the bottom one, and the bottom one, bacteria that make the bottom molecule are impervious to the top one. So these are private, secret conversations that bacteria carry out with their kin that enable them to understand when they have lots of clones around and they should make these public goods. These are the other molecules I told you about. I'll point out the top one, the non-self or the other molecule. This is the universal Esperanto or the trade language of bacteria. This is the molecule for interspecies communication. And what's crucial is that all bacteria make exactly the same molecule. Right? So there's just one molecule in this case versus the many in this case. The newest molecules we've discovered, this is the molecule that the eukaryotes make. And what you can see is it's related to these. It's a mimic. And then we've also found a brand new molecule to mankind that viruses, it's a quorum sensing autoinducer that viruses either make or eavesdrop on so they can take a sense of their host population. Okay, so here's the blend of molecules that we know so far. There are others, but I think you get the principles involved. They encode information about number and about who are my neighbors. And then probably more germane to everybody in your field is that these bacteria are causing disease. And as I told you, quorum sensing is essential for that. And so what you guys know very well, I assume, and what we know in my field is that the lifestyle of bacteria during disease is as biofilms. So they're not shaking around in flasks. Bacteria in the natural world, the predominant way that bacteria live is adhere to either animate or inanimate surfaces in these communities that we call biofilms. And quorum sensing controls biofilm formation and disassembly. And so there are three steps in biofilm, in the developmental life cycle of biofilms. Bacteria will swim down and they will they'll sense that they're on a surface and they will attach. And then they will begin to grow on the surface and they start to express genes only on the surface, biofilm genes. So they adhere to one another, they adhere to the surface, and they cover themselves in a matrix and it's like a suit of armor, which makes them impervious to antibiotics, impervious to flow and impervious to immune 
uh, cells. And then at a particular time that we don't understand, bacteria will decide that they have matured enough in these biofilms. They'll, some of the members will break out, they'll bust out, presumably to go find new territory, and they'll do this cycle again and again and again. And it's important and it's crucial that bacteria can make biofilms during disease. And what we know is that quorum sensing controls all of these steps, attachment, maturation, the production of this extracellular matrix, and also the disassembly and reassembly process. Then, and of course, I've already told you, and you guys already know, this is really important in diseases. And again, they adhere both to animate and inanimate uh, um, surfaces, and so they're just notorious for causing um, infections of implants, but then also they adhere to human tissues and they cause disease, chronic disease, because they're hard to eradicate when they're on either these implanted devices or human tissues as well. So what we'd love to be able to do then is to interfere with quorum sensing now that we know that this is important for bacteria to cause disease and to live as biofilms. And so could this be a new way to think about antimicrobials by making bacteria that can't communicate properly? Because I've told you what we know from our mutants is that if they can't either make the molecules or detect the molecules, they don't understand they're in a group, and so they never turn on their repertoire of biofilm and virulence genes, right? And so you get the idea, I'll reiterate right here, is that say bacteria are growing in a host, either on an implant or on the host itself, right? So they're gonna grow, quorum sensing kicks in, they make their quorum sensing molecules that tells them to change the expression of hundreds of genes. They make a biofilm, cover themselves with this matrix, so that's a community function. And then as a community in the biofilm, the bacteria will simultaneously begin making their virulence factors, the poisons, the toxins that are the components that bacteria make that make us ill. And so we get sick. And so then the big question in my field, now that we've discovered that quorum sensing exists, is whether or not we can make anti-quorum sensing therapies. Could we shut down these command and control circuits and then those the bacteria won't understand they're in a group, they won't make the biofilm, they won't make their virulence factors, and theoretically, we'll be healthy. And so there's lots of uh, energy in this space. One is to make anti-quorum sensing molecules, so analogs, in, you know, antagonists of the real molecules. Another sort of cunning strategy we have is to make pro-quorum sensing molecules. Could we make the bacteria miscount? So they count too high, they show their stuff early, and the immune system has a better chance to wipe them out. Can we make sponges, like antibodies, that pull out the autoinducers and make them disappear? And now that we know that phage or viruses are part of this conversation. We're trying to engineer viruses to make phage therapies that kill bacteria on demand. And so I'll come back to an example of how we're doing that. But in the meantime, let me take a little interlude and talk about this in the context of antibiotic resistance. And so we know that antibiotic resistance is a looming global problem. Our arsenal of antibiotics has run out partly because the microbiologists were asleep at the wheel and didn't realize that bacteria would become resistant, right? But we know that this is a terrible problem across the globe. And so just to remind you a little bit um, in a couple cartoons about antibiotic resistance, antibiotic resistance happens because there are pre-existing resistant mutants in any population of bacteria. You know, as bacteria divide, Mutations occur, just, and then fortuitously, some of those mutations will make a bacterium resistant to an antibiotic. And so because bacteria do evolution on a 20-minute scale, in every population of bacteria, there are pre-existing resistant mutants. So then, when a traditional antibiotic is applied, all traditional antibiotics either work by stopping the growth of bacteria or by killing bacteria. So when a traditional antibiotic is applied, most of the bacteria die, but of course the fortuitous, lucky 
mutant that already existed that is resistant, it is impervious to the antibiotic, and because all of the other bacteria have died, there's no competition for resources or growth or territory, and so the resistant mutant divides, all of its offspring are resistant, and this is how we get the global spread of antibiotic resistance. It's because the traditional antibiotics apply a selective pressure that kills off the non-resistant mutants, enabling a huge advantage for the resistance, the pre-existing mutants, and its offspring to live. So the question is, is there another? So that's how every antibiotic any of us has ever taken works. And so, of course, you see that, that those select, traditional antibiotics select for resistant mutants. And so the question in my field, is there another way to think about antimicrobials. And so, of course, quorum sensing is sort of first up in the game of thinking about behavior modification for antimicrobials. So the idea is that if there was a population of bacteria, you know, virulent bacteria, for sure, if we had an anti-quorum sensing molecule, so a molecule that stops quorum sensing from happening, for sure there will be pre-existing mutants that are resistant to the therapy. But if you think about or we think about how the therapy works, you know, it makes bacteria so they can't communicate. It doesn't kill them. It doesn't change their growth. And so what would happen? You don't kill off all the competitors, right? They're still there, but they're not doing quorum sensing, right? And so these, most of the bacteria, all the ones that are in white in my slide, they're not doing quorum sensing. They don't turn on biofilms. They don't turn on virulence genes. Now, the resistant mutant that's not affected by the fantasy anti-quorum sensing molecule it engages in quorum sensing. You know, it's, it's perceiving the autoinducers. It's not affected by the anti-quorum sensing medicine, right? And it's going, it's making all of its biofilm genes, it's making its virulence genes, but nobody else in the community is participating. It's going like, come on, you guys, come on, you guys, time to do quorum sensing. But since nobody else makes the public goods, turns on virulence genes, it doesn't get an advantage. And indeed, in the lab, this mutant that we've made on purpose, we've constructed this mutant, a resistant mutant on purpose, it has a growth disadvantage because you only get the advantage of quorum sensing when the community participates. So this red guy in my slide has turned on hundreds of quorum sensing genes, but it, the, because the group isn't participating, in fact, it's like running out of energy trying to do all these behaviors, but it doesn't get the profit because its neighbors aren't participating. So the theory in my field, quorum sensing in all kinds of other bacterial behaviors, the idea in our view for anti, the future of antimicrobials is that perhaps by doing behavior modification, we can get new kinds of antimicrobials that will have a longer shelf life than these traditional ones. For sure, the bacteria are going to get resistance, but we think it's a lot harder to get around these kinds of behavior modification therapies than traditional antibiotics that select for resistant mutants. And so that's the big burgeoning idea in the field. So let me go back to the main story and see if we can put any uh, meat on those bones. So we wanted to try to do that. We wanted to see whether we could make an anti-quorum sensing inhibitory molecule and see if it could work. Like, is there even merit to the idea of shutting down quorum sensing as a therapeutic? So what we decided to do is to work on a notorious pathogen called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's an opportunistic pathogen. It just lives in the dirt, but it is an extreme biofilm former. It has a repertoire of about 50 virulence genes. It affects people. It infects people that have cystic fibrosis. If that's what kills people that have CF, burn victims, um, wounds, and it's running around in hospitals. It's one of these hospital-acquired infections because it's so good at making biofilms that it's on surfaces in hospitals because people that are sick come to hospitals with pseudomonas, right? So this one is a good guy to try to start with because it's a, a pathogen that's really imp clinically important. And also we knew a lot about its quorum sensing system. And so as I've been telling you before, what we know are the quorum sensing molecules that pseudomonas makes. And what we know is that absolutely those molecules, the autoinducers control 
the ability of pseudomonas to sit on the surface, to make the matrix, make a biofilm, and to express its virulence genes, its poisons. So we knew a lot about the system having studied it. So this is the self molecule that Pseudomonas makes. I showed you this a few slides ago. So this is the molecule that Pseudomonas uses to count its kin and to decide whether, when to turn on virulence. So we knew what the molecule was. And so using synthetic chemistry and a library approach, we made an inhibitor. And so what you see is that this is the, the natural molecule and our molecule is a competitive inhibitor. So the left hand side of the molecule looks a lot like the real molecule. There's a sulfur here instead of an oxygen. That's because this is much harder um, to cleave. So this is a very stable molecule. And then basically what we did was we put a big bump on the right hand end of the molecule. And what happens is when we, we apply our molecule to Pseudomonas, this molecule fits into the quorum sensing receptor for the autoinducer and jams it. So it's an antagonist. Okay, so we could prove that in a test tube. We could prove that if we applied our molecule, Pseudomonas doesn't make a biofilm on a petri plate and it doesn't express its canonical virulence factors. So the question is, can it work outside of a petri plate? And so I'll show you our newest um, experiments. This is our animal model. We have an animal model for Pseudomonas infection. And so what we're measuring is how many, pseudo how many animals are alive over time. And so of course, if we don't give the inhibitor, um, uh, excuse me, if we don't give Pseudomonas, all of the animals are alive a day later. If we infect the animal with Pseudomonas, they all die. Okay, so now you see that the model works. So then what we did was we infected with Pseudomonas in the context of our inhibitor, and what you can see is that all of the animals live. So this is our first step to to try to prove that there could be merit behind this idea of shutting down quorum sensing. I want to be really clear, it's not a medicine. You'd have to take a pill this big and it would kill you because we haven't done the medicinal chemistry to make the molecule safe, to make it go where we want to go, and to make it high potency. But we wanted to get some um, evidence that this approach could work before we did the medicinal chemistry. And so that's the step that we're at right now, is we're trying to make this molecule much more medicine-like and see what is the window of time that we have that we could give it. And so the jury is out on that, but m myself and then many others in the field are working on projects like this. And then, of course, the big question is going to be, do we really get this fantasy reduction in antibiotic resistance? Do we get a longer shelf life out of these molecules? We don't know. We need to make the molecule more potent in order to test for resistance. And so again, that's what the team is working on now. And so that's the story I wanted to tell you today. Let me just um, reiterate a couple of points. I hope what you think is that bacteria can talk to each other. They use a chemical language. What we think quorum sensing allows bacteria to be is multicellular. We think that bacteria, I mean, I'm obviously brainwashed and, and in love with bacteria. We think that bacteria evolved multicellularity billions of years ago, and the principles that allow robust communication and that allow um, bacteria to synchronize gene expression, we think that those principles might have rose up through evolution, so we hope that we're helping our colleagues that work on higher organisms by studying these simpler multicellular systems. I already said this point, we've shown that quorum sensing allows bacteria to tell self from other, friend from foe. Again, we hope that the rules that we learn with these simple systems will be useful to those of you who study chemical communication and um, in higher organisms. There's now a, a big push in the field to develop strategies to impede quorum sensing in harmful bacteria. But going back to my first slide, we also now, that now understand that most of our lives are with this magical, miraculous consortium of bacteria, the microbiome. We know that quorum sensing is crucial in the microbiome, so we're also trying to improve quorum sensing in the bacteria beneficial bacteria that live in and on us. We know that these beneficial bacteria work hand in hand with our immune system to fend off predatory bacteria, and so perhaps the real way forward in medicine is to improve the chit-chatting among these beneficial bacteria at the expense of these invaders. And so again, that's a very new part of my field. And then finally, I'll finish with a confession that we didn't think this up. You know, now that um, 
my lab and lots of other labs have this idea that we could manipulate quorum sensing, we started to think, wait a minute, these bacteria have been out there fighting it out for billions of years. And so sure enough, when you go out mining for these strategies out in nature, there's cheaters, there's free riders, there's eavesdroppers, there's guys that make enzyme that cut cut their enemies autoinducer in half. And so what we're doing is bringing those natural strategies into the lab because those have succeeded over billions of years of evolution. And the idea that Bonnie and a couple of 22-year-olds can make a better strategy is ridiculous. And so what we're doing then is just getting those strategies from nature, bringing them into the lab and tinkering with them because they've been proven over evolutionary times and maybe that should be our inspiration for how to make medicines and other applications for industry and agriculture. Here's my gang. This is us in my front yard this past summer in Princeton, New Jersey. And so I'm so lucky and so grateful to get to come talk to you. But of course, I'm just the spokesperson for this team. And people in this picture made all of the discoveries that I'm talking about today. They're just thrilling to work with and to um, work on this project with. And so again, I so thank you for listening to a talk from outside of your field. I hope that we can all work together. It's quorum sensing. We get, the group gets more than the individual. I hope that our, our fields will intersect in many, many meaningful ways, right, going forward, and that we can also help in your mission to make people healthier. And then one more time, it is especially thrilling to get to be a part of this um, magnificent session. Thank you.